this is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. This is The Creative Life Podcast with James Taylor, episode number one. The Creative Life Podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. Hey, it's James Taylor here, and I'm excited to have today Rolf Potts. Uh, Travel writer Rolf Potts is the author of Vagabonding, and Marco Polo didn't go there. His adventures have taken him across six continents and include piloting a fishing boat 900 miles down the Laotian Mekong, driving a Land Rover across the Americas, and traveling around the world for six weeks with no luggage. His love of living and writing about the art of long-term travel and essentialism put him in the company of Kerouac, Whitman, Hemingway, and Thoreau. Each July, he can be found in France, where he is the summer writer in residence and program director at the Paris American Academy. So, Rolf, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, James. So, share with our listeners what's going on in your world, what you're currently working on. I'm in Buenos Aires, Argentina right now, um, and I'm working on... The same writing projects I would be working on in the U.S., but here it's summer instead of winter, and I got tired of uh, short days and cold weather. So I'm exploring the city of Buenos Aires and, and working on some screenplays, um, which, I've, which I always joke are sort of a, a midlife crisis project. I, I'm not a screenwriter by trade, but sometimes it's nice to do something different. So uh, I'm doing a little screenwriting. So you've, you've managed to escape the, uh, the, the, the wild weather that the U.S. is having just now for a little bit of, uh, bit of warmth and sun over the winter. Exactly. Yeah, it, it, I can go days without even thinking about snow. I, um, <laughs> it's it's a news headline from a distant world uh, to me, which is nice. I'm I'm sweating as I talk to you. It's great. <laughs> so, Sheila, listen. I mean, how did you first um, get involved in writing? How did you kind of learn your your craft initially? Um, I think writing is something that was always a creative pursuit of mine, and. Um, this is even something I tell my students in Paris that it's for all the principles of writing that can be taught, it's really a process. It's a matter of sort of banging your head up against the wall of writing and working your way through and, and coming up against uh, your own challenges and your own talents over the years. I, I wrote a little book on dinosaurs when I was seven years old um, and then just continued to write, wrote for my school newspaper in high school, um, and then sort of tried to write, I traveled around the United States for eight months, uh, at, not long after college, tried to write a book about that, failed to write a book about that, but that failure along with many other ones were very much a part of what would eventually become my success. So as I tell my uh, students in Paris that, that for all the principles of writing that can be taught, it's a matter of just doing it day after day, sometimes succeeding, sometimes not, uh, until it becomes an intuitive part of your craft. And as a writer, I mean, where, where do some of your new ideas generally come from? If, you, if you're thinking of a, a particular theme that you want to write about or a, you're talking about doing screenplays now as well, where do they generally come from and how do you go about developing that idea? Well, travel is a great place to get ideas. Um, even if you don't intend on becoming a travel writer, even if you're you know, a musician or a filmmaker or someone who has other creative ideas in mind, uh, travel is just a way to force you to look at things in new ways. So that's good. Uh, keeping a journal, again, even if you're not going to be a published writer, keeping a journal of your days at home or your days on the road are a good way to engage yourself creativ- creatively. And then also just making connections. You know, um, uh, Even though I've traveled around the world, I end up writing a lot about Kansas, historical or current day situations. Uh, in Kansas. And so sometimes just looking a little bit closer at the home that you've taken for granted is a good way to find um, ideas that you didn't know were right in front of your nose. And how have you, has your kind of creative process changed over the past, say, 20 years? Um, I mean, imagine if, you, if you're on the, on the road a lot, has, do you tend to then, uh, obviously you're writing on the road, but then doing more of the kind of heavy duty writing when you get home and a lot of the editing when you get back, back to, to the US? Or has it changed uh, over your, your journey as a writer? It's changed some ways, and in other ways it hasn't. I mean, I think there's always, and other writers will tell you this, that there's always a struggle to get words on the page. You know, after 
uh, after a couple of books with a third book coming out this spring and, and hundreds, if not thousands of articles, it still is a struggle. You know, in, in, so, in certain ways, I'm still my 19 year old self when I'm struggling against the blank page and getting the process started. Um, and that's an important thing to remember that even for experienced writers, it's not, it's not always easy. Um, and so that has remained the same. I think, um, one thing that has changed is just, I've, I've continued to realize how important it is to keep reading. Um, I think when I was younger, there's this idea that writing is a magical process that comes purely out of the self when, and this is another thing I teach my students in Paris, um, reading and reading well, just constantly getting in the habit of, of reading, not just for information, but for style and language and, and realizing that it's almost like practicing your free throws uh, if you're a basketball player, uh, of just reading good work so that those, that good, that literary sensibility will show up in your own writing. So reading well, I haven't heard that expression before. T- tell me more about that. What does that mean? Well, that means finding, you know, not just reading for entertainment, but finding the best writers that are out there. Finding uh, one thing, when I taught at Yale, um, we called it uh, reading for craft, um, where you find an essay that just, or a book, or a story, or a poem that really blows your mind and, and it just takes you to a different place and really helps you see things in a new way. And then you go back and you try to figure out uh, the strategies of how the writer came to be this person who wrote this amazing work. Again, it, it goes back to the idea that a writer is just someone by themselves at a computer or on a notepad or a typewriter um, putting words on the page. And if you can learn to read as a writer and, and again, read good, strong literary stuff, not just whatever BuzzFeed top 10 list is on your social media, but, but um, you know, the greats, uh, Joan Didion and David Foster Wallace and, and uh, Hemingway and Virginia Woolf and all the great writers that have come before, if you can get into the habit of reading them and immersing yourself in their language and thinking, how did they construct this? How did they make these connections? Then that's just a very subtle thing that can become a part of your own creative process. And are there any things, you know, some of our listeners who um, aren't able to get to uh, go to Yale or go to um, a, a longer kind of writing summer school, are there any advice that you tend to give them uh, in terms of ways to uh, kind of unpick great writers and, and work out what they're doing and some of the, some of the craft of what they're doing? Um, I think it, it's, it's not just close reading, but deep reading. It's like if you find a, a, a piece of writing that really moves you or really made you think about maybe a common thing in a new way, go back and read it several times. Um, mark out the, you know, the places where you're especially engaged uh, and, just, and just go back and look at how the sentences are constructed. Actually, writing is something that can be really complex. I guess it's like any uh, creative pursuit. Um, but look at it, look at it, how are this, how is information presented inside the paragraphs? How is information and phrasing work inside the sentences? Um, do you find any situations, are there any words that you might cut out if you were an editor? Um, and you basically just engage yourself. You become so familiar with this piece of work that not just strategically, but almost intuitively that writing becomes a part of your own view as a writer. I know that uh, Hunter Thompson, um, you know, who's, who wrote many famous books, yeah. probably his famous one was Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Uh, when he was young, he was so enamored of F. Scott Fitzgerald that he typed out The Great Gatsby um, so that he would uh, know what it was like to have written a great novel. And that sounds absurd, but really that forced him at a very slow and deliberate way to get into each of the sentences and of F. Scott Fitzgerald and think about that book in, in a new way. So I think any time that you go deep in a piece of writing um, and think about what it was like to write that work, then it's going to pay creative w- rewards for you. I suppose it's a little bit like a musician learning a, a Beatles song and trying to get really kind of close to that, how that was you know, performed originally. And as part of that, they, they learn a lot about songwriting in the process. Yeah, I think it's something that musicians do better than writers. It's something that you, I mean, as a musician, you start out covering other people's work. And you mentioned the Beatles. I mean, they played, uh, they played Chuck Berry songs in, in Germany for years and years. Malcolm Gladwell has written about that, about how just, just plain old uh, blues and rock music 
for hours and hours and hours at a strip club in Germany made the Beatles who they are. It made them so intuitively connected to music that in spite of their natural genius, the, um, I think Gladwell calls it the 10,000 hour um, principle. Um, they be- just became intuitively more familiar with the music. And, and I'm not saying that, that every writer should retype every, every article or book that, that um, they're engaged with, but it's part of a process, almost like a, a journaling process that, that's worth it, you know. Uh, you're not going to be like a musician and that you're constantly covering other people's work, but it can't hurt to engage yourself in other people's writing in a way that enhances your own. And you're known for, as well as the actually the books and vagabonding as a you know, real great kind of seminal book as well, but you're also known as an essayist and a, um, as, as, a, as a blogger as well, and now obviously you're moving into um, screen, screenwriting as well. H- how do those different styles of writing, uh, how are they different in terms of from the, from the creation part, from actually the, the, both the craft and also the, the art of kind of getting good at those things? Well, they're... They're, they're different, but they're same. Uh, they're similar in ways, too, because narrative is narrative, and telling a story, be it in the essayistic form or, or a screenwriting st- uh, form, has a lot of basic principles that um, have things in common, just like the idea of, of getting your reader's attention, creating a certain sense of mystery or anticipation early on, is something that, that um, you'll find in a David Foster Wallace essay, the same thing as in a, a Buck Henry screenplay. Um, and in fact, early on when I was trying to write my first failed book that I wrote in my, in my early mid-20s, one of my epiphanies was dabbling in screenwriting while I was trying to write this book. And the book ended up being very chronological. The sentences were kind of pretty, but it was just so chronological. There was nothing that narrative about it. I was just sort of telling the story sequentially. And it was through struggling through a screenplay that I realized that structure is very, very important. Uh, And there's no room. Screenplays are sometimes assumed to be easy because there's so few words. There's a lot of blank space on the page. But man, a screenplay is all structure. There's no room for fat at all. There's no room for digression. You either tell the story in a very tight way in a way that keeps the viewer in, involved, or you don't have a successful screenplay. And I realized that even though a travel book is a different monster in a way, it's still dependent on structure. If you don't have structure, if you don't create a certain sense of anticipation and of setup and payoff, then the reader's not going to be interested. Um, and so that was a huge breakthrough for me. Um, that through, And so I guess um, in a way, screenplays are a new thing because I haven't had a movie produced and... and uh, very few people have movies produced. And I, I, I'm not super serious about screenwriting, but even 20 years ago, dabbling in screenplays was actually teaching me lessons about my, what became my central form of writing, which is essays and travel writing. Um, <clears throat> and so the form of screenwriting is, is very different, just like a, a bellatristic essay will be a little bit different than a travel book, but they all have that important structural element of telling a story. Uh, and it's another thing that I tell uh, my, my students in Paris or Yale, that it's okay, in, in nonfiction, it's okay to tell the reader, look, I'm going to tell you a story. When you come, if you go out for drinks with some friends at a bar and you see a fight, you're not going to come home and say, hey, I woke up this morning, I, I cooked some breakfast, I, I went to the bar, I ordered this and that, I went to the bathroom, the ur- urinal cake smelled like pine, and I came back and there was a fight. No, you start out by saying, oh my God, there was a fight. And so a lot of times you have to realize as a nonfiction writer that you have permission to say, look, I'm going to tell you a story and here's what's important. And then you start back at the beginning and you work your way up to that important moment. And the reader has it in their mind that, oh, I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to be enlightened. I'm going to be entertained in some way. Um, and it's not cheating to tell the reader up front that that's going to happen. And that's, that's something that I've seen across mediums where basically you're sitting the reader or the viewer down and saying, I'm going to tell you something important. And in your essay writing and, and the, the pieces you do for a lot of the travel magazines and also the books as well, I mean, how long did it take you to kind of find find your voice as a, as a writer, or something that resonated where you, you felt this was quite truthful in terms of what was going on in your head was truthfully kind of coming onto the onto the page and there wasn't any any kind of flux in between it. It, it felt authentic. Well, that, my voice is still something that, that's a work in progress, but I think – 
my, I think when I was in high school, when I was younger, I was pretty good at making people laugh. I was good at writing engaging humor columns. Um, but then when I was failing in, in my early mid twenties, um, I guess I, I just worked through it to a point, and, and again, reading helped with this, that um, I was able by my late twenties to write an essay that was very specific and very universal. This is another thing I, I teach with my students is that in telling the story that's unique to yourself, you have to either directly or subtly make sure that it is, uh, specific in a way that the reader can think, Hmm, this, this is teaching me a lesson as well. Um, and once I was able to do that, once, once I was able to more comfortably tell stories that were universal as well as specific, everything blew up and, and, and started to happen for me. So like in 1998, I got my first real byline. Um, in 1999, I was a columnist for Salon. In 2000, I was in the best American travel writing, and I had my contract for vagabonding by 2001. So things happened very quickly. After, after years of wandering through the desert, as it were, and of wanting to be a writer but not succeeding for probably, I would say, three or four or five years, then once – once it clicked, things happened very quickly for me. And what got you? I mean, that that period that you mentioned in your kind of mid twenties, where you were really struggling. You were saying that you were you were struggling to, you know, get that narrative going, and and obviously you were kind of developing your your craft as a writer as well. Um, but things maybe weren't taking as quickly as you'd hoped. What what got you through that period? What kept you um, motivated as a writer? Um, how did you kind of ensure you didn't get kind of stuck in a rut? Uh, travel was one thing that helped for sure. Uh, I'll never be able to know scientifically, but it was during this time, basically after I failed to write my book about traveling around America, I moved to Korea and started to teach English. I had some friends who were in the city of Busan um, teaching English as, as a foreign language to Koreans. And I think that engaged me and sort of enlarged my intellect in, in a certain way, is that I'd traveled around the States, but I'd never really committed to another culture. And again, I can't be scientific, and there's other factors, writing every day, journaling, reading good writers, but suddenly sort of having my mind blown in a way of coming to terms with a completely different culture, of being an employee of Korean bosses, and, and just having this paradigm shift, I think it allowed me to let go in a certain sense. I think writers are so obsessed sometimes, young writers, with their craft that they get really frustrated. And I think that being forced to live in another culture sort of, it took my intellect and my mind away from my writing in such a way that it gave it perspective. Uh, and that then suddenly when I came back with writing with new intensity, I had, I don't know if outsider's perspective is the word, but suddenly I was able to, to bring it to the new level. So for all these factors, including writing every day and, and reading constantly, um, that, that key travel experience of living in a new country, I think, was part of my breakthrough. So, so that insight that you talked about being in that different culture, as you've, you've had this journey as a creative, as, as a writer, are there any other um, kind of key insights or kind of key light bulb moments in, in that journey where you've made some kind of realization, okay, oh, this is maybe the, where I need to go with my writing or, or a particular direction or, or something that you, you need to, um, to change uh, in the kind of work that you do? I think it was that moment in my, in my early 20s when I, was, when I brought the this, this structure principles uh, from screenwriting into my nonfiction writing that was the breakthrough. And I think it's important to remember that even though it was a breakthrough, I didn't get my first byline until three or four years later. Uh, and I think for creative people, this is a good lesson to keep in mind that sometimes your epiphanies aren't concurrent with your professional breakthrough. They're, 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 it's a creative breakthrough that might not pay dividends until, you know, professionally until later. Um, and so it really was that idea. And, and this is something when I, when I teach my writing students, the very first lesson is always about structure. It's always about keeping your reader involved because in nonfiction writing, especially too many young writers just think that it's about telling your story as it happened about listing things chronologically when in fact structuring, structuring and ordering those events is essential. And, and so, yeah, it was that epiphany that I learned through structuring a screenplay. And then I realized that you always have to structure, like there's, there's no three, there's no screenwriting classic book in, in, in or 
there's no uh, nonfiction book that tells you the formula for writing uh, nonfiction because it's a more complex genre than movie writing. Movie writing, there's like Sid Field's uh, screenplay book that teaches you how to write three-act screenplays. There's Robert McKee's book about story that teaches you principles, if not formula. There's no equivalent in nonfiction writing, but by using that screenplay structure as a metaphor for the structure that goes into uh, essay writing, that just, that just changed everything in, in, in a very essential way for me. And uh, when you think of this, the, the the writer, uh, in, in many of the kind of different creative professions, whether it's a songwriter, you've got songwriters uh, often working with another person, uh, often kind of creative peers. Um, I listened to a thing the other day with, I think it was Brian Copelman talking about um, screenwriting. And uh, he was talking about he has a kind of creative partner partnership that gives him that kind of feedback loop. And obviously within film, uh, often within music, with a lot of other areas, there's you're, you're maybe part of a team, even if a team of two. But with with writing, you're always so you're always kind of really working on your own as a writer. Is, is that the same when you're doing the, the, the screenwriting side as well? You've, you've consciously said this is this is something you're going to do um, solo rather than maybe working with someone else. Yeah, I guess I've never um, – I, I think screenwriting lends itself towards partnership in a way that maybe essay writing doesn't. Um, I haven't – I guess I – it could be because I haven't found the right screenplay partner yet. And in a way, I'm still – even though I've, I've completed three or four screenplays and I'm, I'm working on a couple more, it's still sort of a sideline. I know that my career is not dependent upon this. And, and if I was to get serious about it, I'd probably have to move to Los Angeles or New York and really work the professional aspect of it. And so it's sort of a, um, it's a sideline for me. Um, I, I think one great thing about partners is that it, there's this account, accountability that you, um, it's almost as if you have, you have deadlines and, and another set of eyes on your creative work and it allows you to be focused in a way that you normally aren't. And I don't know if it's a conscious, I think it's working alone on screenplays is an intuitive decision. Um, and perhaps when I find somebody that I click with creatively for screenplays specifically, I might eventually uh, write with a partner. But if you, if you look at, uh, at people who work in the business, it's, it, it's a mix. There's a lot of screenplay writers who just work completely by themselves. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, partners as well. So, so we'll just see, we'll, we'll see where that journey takes me. Um, yeah, it was, it was funny. A friend of mine just gave me his book recently. Um, There's a writer called uh, Majid Nawaz who just wrote a book with uh, uh, Sam Harris. And, um, and it was interesting, the format of that book, it was really a kind of conversation. It was a nonfiction book, but it was a kind of conversation. And I, I, I asked Majid, I said, how did you actually write that in the end? I said, it was actually just a series of of um, email conversations kind of going back and forth as well. And it, it added something kind of different to it rather than just because you're so used to hearing a, the solo voice all the time as well. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I just read a book, uh, a conversation with the anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss. Um, and that format can be interesting. Uh, oftentimes, like in this particular book, it was, it was based on radio inter interviews in France from the 40s or 50s. Sometimes I wished that the, the, the interviewer had pushed him, had stayed on anthropology. They ended up being about art. Uh, that's interesting form too, the, the conversation, the oral history. Um, and I think the key to success in that sort of thing is, is having uh, an interviewer, a questioner, who can really be focused and carry that thread through in an interesting way, almost be an avatar for the reader or listener yeah. to sort of sense those questions that are going to be popping up, and questions and interests that are going to be popping up in the reader or listener's head. Uh, and so this this Sam Harris book you thought was effective? I, I, I thought it was I thought it was effective. There were there were times um, because you had people coming from uh, different positions on the on the central question of this of this book, and I thought it was interesting. Both really sharp people, um, and so they they explored it in a different way that I hadn't really seen before. Um, whether that's a commercial success, <laughs> I'm not so sure. But um, just sure. as a, as a reader, I thought it was an interesting way of exploring a exploring an issue um, that isn't often talked about. It's usually yeah, you know you'll have one writer who'll write very strongly from one position, another writer will write strongly from another position, or if you have on TV, um, they obviously with uh, TV producers they like to put people with two. Ex ex really views at the extremes because it makes for good TV. It just doesn't make for very interesting yeah. debate. Um, and I just thought that the book was interesting about how they tried to kind of um, kind of play around with the format a little bit as well. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I've never I've never gone deep into that format, but I I know that I've read some compelling things. 
and the, they the have that form. And the students you have, um, when you're teaching in Paris or if you're doing stuff at Yale, I, I would imagine you mentioned right at the very start that you know the blank page. Um, how uh, how do you talk about and, and teach your students around uh, creative block, or do you th- see it as a thing? Because uh, I know some um, some teachers, some writers say it's, it's not really they, they don't give it um uh much of a a, a say they uh they maybe teach other techniques and other things to kind of um deal with stuff around it but what's your take on on creative block as a writer and how do you deal with a, with the students coming to you that be, is really struggling on something I'm a, I'm a big believer in like journaling and free writing, uh, especially for my students who sometimes come in with ideas of what they think they're supposed to write, but oftentimes it's A, not what they want to write, and, and, and B, not what they're actually good at writing. And so um, in, in Paris and in Yale both, I'll often begin each class with free writing, where basically uh, I say, we're gonna, we're gonna write, I'm going to give you something to write about or some ideas to write about, and you're going to write five minutes, and you can't not write, and it doesn't count. It doesn't matter. Nothing's going to come of this. And invariably, it happens every summer I'm in Paris, is that free writing, it ends up being what my students really wanted to write about. And suddenly they're writing their way into a new intellectual or emotional place that if they had sat down with the blank page, they wouldn't have come to. Uh, and so I think oftentimes... Um, the way to, to, to start writing something with high stakes is to just write anything with no stakes at all and stumble into something that's a lot better than, than you might have intentionally come up with. There's the, the great African-American uh, playwright, August Wilson, talked about how he would always, his earliest ideas always came on yellow notepads and napkins and, and um, you know, cereal boxes. Yeah. And how once he was sitting in a cafe and... Um, the waitress is here. What are you doing? He's, he's here. Oh, I just I had some ideas. I'm writing them down on a napkin. And she said, "Oh, well, that's great. You can write down your ideas on something, and it doesn't count." And he he really latched on to the idea that when you write in a way that it doesn't count, it doesn't matter. There are no stakes. Then suddenly you are engaging your own writing in a way that feeds the actual writing that does have stakes and that does count. So it's a great exercise. Um, and there, there are books out there with writing prompts and, and, and various strategies for, for getting out of your over-intellectualized head and just letting the writing flow until you can start filling that blank page. Yes, yeah, funny. I, I mean, I can't remember if it was some of your writing or maybe it, it could have been um, possibly Hugh McLeod um, who said that the, this thing maybe a lot of people have in their heads of uh, going off to a, a distant place somewhere in Ireland and uh, having some beautiful uh, leather-bound book that they're going to write in, and that's finally when they'll be able to to write. And and uh, I can't remember if it was you or it could have been you was was very disparaging of that of that mindset. Um, and mm. just talking about the actual, you know, the the, the books. I, I I see this a lot with songwriters. Songwriters usually have no lack of having lots of lovely uh, notepads and notebooks. Um, uh, but you, so you were just saying there about the, the I suppose, the, the little bit of the kind of tools of your trade as well um mm. so what what is your take on uh you know you're writing in, in screenwriting now i'm imagining you're maybe using uh, maybe slightly different tools to to write with um different maybe programs than you might be writing if you're doing essay writing yeah well actually one one program that i've that i've started using in the last year that sort of covers both is scrivener Are yeah you, i use that it's great yeah um i um i ended up writing a book about hip hop that's going to be coming out this spring. And, um, it, it was, it's very heavily reported and researched and it's sort of a, a field that I am less experienced in. And man, I, it, it just, Scrivener really helped me to organize my research in such a, um, in such a rational way. Uh, and screenwriting similarly, I, I use, I use, um, oh gosh, what's the name of my screenwriting program. I, I, I found that for screenwriting, I, um, I am uh, organizing my screenplay in Scrivener, uh, and then I type it in Final Draft. There's actually in, there's functions inside of Scrivener where you can write the screenplay inside of Scrivener, but um, I've found that I, am, I have two windows open. I have my, my Scrivener notes from my screenplay on one side of the screen, and then I have, then I have my Final Draft um, 
the actual script going in another window. And, and that's just, I think, one nice thing about Scrivener is that it allows people with different creative styles to use it in different ways. Yeah. And if you watch the training videos, gosh, you can go really deep in Scrivener. There's all these different ways you can, you know, play around with, with the functions and organize your information. I find of the 2,000 things you can do with Scrivener, I use about five of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and, and that's all I need. You know, I just need this interface where I can see all of my research and all of my narrative in one place. And it has been extraordinarily, I guess this is my endorsement, but Scrivener has been extraordinarily useful for me uh, in screenwriting as well as my nonfiction work. No, I mean, it's a great tool. I, I, I've, I've been using it recently. Um, and it's not the most high tech of tools, but it, it gets the job done. And it's, uh, I think it's, it's um, I actually quite like its simplicity as well. And as you mentioned, there's, mm. there's different format ways you can view them. You know, you can have it more like, um, almost like a post-it notes style uh, as mm. well, which I can imagine that's quite useful for, you know, putting plots around and trying different scenes and, and different things, maybe if you're doing uh, screenwriting. Um, when it comes to thinking about the, the structure of, of what you're working on, do you, do you kind of go for those uh, like mapping out structures on, on a pad or do you go straight on to kind of digital you know, in something like a Scrivener? I think it all starts on a pad. And, and actually, I, since I started teaching that old August Wilson advice of using a yellow pad, I've started using a yellow legal pad myself. Yeah. Um, in part because there's something very disposable to a legal pad. You know, you have those, you have uh, moleskin notebooks or those nice, elegant journals you can buy. Um, I think it's important for me, at least creatively, is to have something that is literally disposable, that I can't keep, I have to tear off my legal pad sheets one at a time. And that's sort of, that's sort of my workspace, is that that is not permanent and I can throw things away. And then I'll, I'll, I'll literally just outline things, make little sequential lists of ideas on the yellow pad. And that's where I work it out. And then when I put it into Word or put it into Scrivener, then suddenly it's on a different level of organization. And I found that my, my yellow legal pads work with Scrivener quite well. Um, on one of the screenplays I was working with, it, it all existed as little yellow notes in a, in a binder. And often I, I came back to it after having left it for a while to work on the hip-hop book. And it made no sense to me. Um, and so... I, I put a lot of those yellow notes into Scrivener, which gives it a little bit more sense of permanence. And one nice thing about Scrivener is you can move things around very easily and, and, and change sequences and, and throw entire sequences away and then pull them out of the trash if you want. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, that, that, um, it starts on paper and then it moves to the computer. And, and I found that, that it changes, that there isn't – I've been writing for 20 years, but there's not one way of working that always um, – I always go back to. And in fact, I find myself taking a lot of notes on my phone now. Mm -hmm. It used to be sort of a pocket moleskin type thing. And now it's just, I found it more convenient nine times out of 10 that I'll just, whatever stray thought I have, I'll just put it into the note functions on my phone. And, um, and then, then I can email it to myself and it'll be part of my creative process. Just as Scrivener is something that came into my, you know, when I wrote Vagabonding, I had all of these note cards taped to a wall and that's how I organize the structure of vagabonding. Now I could probably do that same thing. I could spare the wall and do it in Scrivener, but Scrivener is not something I discovered until, until um, uh, a year ago. And, and who knows what, what strategies I'll be using in five years, but it's, a, it's an ongoing process and it, it's, it all works. Technology aside, it's all part of the same mental process. The technology, be it, be it yellow paper or Scrivener, is how I stay organized and how I implement that that creative process. I mean, yes, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Those different kind of strategies that writers have. Um, I think, I think Stephen Pressfield, he, he has this kind of full scap. He, I think he talks it on the screenwriting, you know, the yellow pad um, way that he, he basically maps out the strat, the, um, the structure of his, of his, uh, of his films that he's, he's working on. And then I think Ryan Holiday, He's got a completely different system. I think it was taught to him by, I'm trying to remember the name of the writer. He wrote mastery, um, uh, uh, trying to remember, they've forgotten the name of the writer, which it just consists of lots of um, uh, uh, one of these uh, post-it notes cards that he's working on around subject areas, and then it's it's almost the way a little bit more like a someone that's doing a TV show would work, where they essentially post up all these things and see what the themes are, and often you don't know what the themes are until <laughs> he's got a whole bunch of these uh, these cards as well. Yeah, that's that's something. Um that's a good thing to keep in mind that sometimes you write yourself into new situations that it's that it's through 
you know, mixing the cards around or through the writing itself that you discover things that you could, could never have planned. I've, I've recently been reading a series of interviews from the Paris Review with great writers from, you know, Ernest Hemingway to James Baldwin to Joan Didion. Um, and it's fun because, because the interviews go all the way back to the 50s and 60s and up to the present day. Um, and I'll, read the, I'll often uh, save them to Instapaper and read them, you know, two or three at a sitting. And you'll be, I'll be reading, you know, Don DeLillo writing in the 1980s before personal computers were really part of the process. And it's fun to see these people who are really into writing their entire book uh, longhand or on typewriters or something. And just to realize that so much, <laughs> like the personal computer era and the Microsoft Word era and the Scrivener era are very new. Um, and, and even the final draft era, screenplays were written on typewriters. And yet all of this great work was done in what feels like a very primitive way, yet it mm. did get done. It worked. Um, it worked. It's like yeah. the, the, the Roald Dahl. I was reading the other day about Roald Dahl's method, and, and he would have six uh, of these certain types of pencils, and he would sharpen them all before he started writing, and he would write long form for – and it, he worked out that those six pencils were basically about two hours. By the time they got uh, oh. blunt, <laughs> that was two hours worth of writing. And that, uh -huh. was, that, that was his way. And then, and, and then he would give it to someone to, you know, to type it up and everything. Um, but that, that's, that's what kind of work, worked for him. Yeah, it's almost as if you have to find ways to trick and motivate yourself into getting the work done yeah. and, and giving yourself a sense of accomplishment. Speaking of my yellow pads, there's one sitting next to me right now, and it has my tasks to do today. Sometimes the, the prospect of writing an essay or a chapter or something is almost too daunting. And, and like I sort of I somehow get satisfaction for crossing things off the list. Mm. Um, and so I'll even break a chapter or an essay down into its component parts and I'll find that it's easier to think, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to get the first 500 words done today. And oftentimes because I have that goal of crossing it off my list, I'll get it done much faster and I'll be able to do 1000 words in a day. Uh, and so again, it's those, it, be it the sharpened pencils or, uh, you know, whatever strategies are employed, um, be it the little sub list of things to do. It's all a matter of keeping yourself uh, focused and encouraged and, and moving forward with the project. And different people have different strategies. And I think in a way, each writer has to find their own way of, quote unquote, tricking oneself into getting that work done. And the thing, obviously, a lot of writers don't like to spend too much time thinking about, or or maybe in doing, is is the is the other part of it, the the, the kind of the marketing bit, the going out and helping um, sell the book in, in one form or the other. When, when you're teaching your students, what is your general approach? Because it seems to be a little mini industry now is is cropped up of people either teaching how to market your books or creating courses on how to market and how to sell, sell books, um, whether it's an Amazon or, or, or self-published or however they're going to be doing it. What's your take on the, on the, kind of the marketing bit of it? Um, uh, what, do you, what kind of advice do you tend to give to your students? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm of two minds. Um, one, I think marketing is important, and, and I'm, I must have been one of the first – uh, travel writers to have his own author website and his own blog. I had an author website in 1998 and a blog in 2002. Um, and from an early stage, I used um, I used the internet to promote myself in a way that I couldn't in real life because because I was living in Asia and I was this fairly anonymous person. I sort of had to project project a professionalized version of myself into my websites because I wasn't able to schmooze in New York or London or San Francisco or other places where where people um, are seen in terms of writing. Um, <clears throat> and I've fallen behind a little bit since since social media has come along. I guess I was established before social media came along, and I didn't feel really compelled to build up a social media presence. I mean, I have a fine. I have a Twitter account and, and a Facebook account, but I, I don't. I think I've. I, I'm, I am no longer um, a polished self promoter as as I may have been. Like the, the forms of self promotion that were happening in, in 2001 are much much different than than the way they're done now. And I'm I'm not as much of a self promoter as I was. But the other half of this, and this is what I teach to my students in Paris, is we teach myself and the three other teachers who are involved in this program. We spend an hour or two at the very end of the month talking about promotion and, and agents and publication and things like that because there is often, and, and these days especially, an overemphasis on that sort of thing. <clears throat> and what we want to do, and, and, and at Yale, I don't teach about um, submission and, and promotion at all. 
is that the writing is what's important. And often, sometimes young writers, and I'm sure I, I was this way when I was younger too, are frustrated because um, they, they feel like they need more self-promotion. They need to meet the right people to be successful when, in fact, their writing just isn't there yet. Mm. Um, and and that, th- that four years of you know, wandering through the desert of not being published at all when I was in my 20s was really important to me. And I think in, in my development as a writer, and, and I think if I had self-promoted at that time, instead of just going back to my craft and, and getting better at writing, I would have done myself a disservice. Uh, and so, that, so while I... I, I um, so while I, I recognize the importance of self-promotion, it's sort of a cart before the horse thing. Um, and that young writers especially need to focus on their writing. They need to read well, write well, travel well, get their writing to that important level first, and then spread the word uh, and be persistent about it, um, truly. And, and, and it's a strange balance. I think there's some people who have become um, – who have gotten sort of an audience before their writing has clicked in. And oftentimes that's if, if you have like really good information that sometimes you're, um, you can build an audience based on the information rather than your prose in the world of nonfiction travel, especially. Um, and then they, then over the course of years of giving information, their writing slowly corrects itself and gets much better. But my advice, uh, to, to younger writers or newer writers is, is get the writing there first and then worry about self promotion. There's, Google will, will give you a hundred different strategies on self-promotion and, and through social media or other means, but only yourself, uh, often with the help of mentors, but it's up to you to get your writing in a place where it as, is at a level that has merited self-promotion. So that's my advice. Great. And, and as, as we finish up here as well, if you could recommend just one Rec- uh, one record. Uh, I was going to say one book, um, but but speaking to a writer, yeah, recommending one book is is probably a pretty torturous thing. <laughs> so maybe right. one record to our listeners that they should check out. So I know you've been working. You mentioned you've been doing a lot of hip hop stuff recently as well. But if there's one record that you just think should have a people should check out and listen to, then what would that record be? Hmm. Huh. Um, it's interesting that my book is about hip hop. Um, and I was, I was never a full hip-hop head. I was never fully immersed in hip-hop. But it occurred to me intellectually all these years later that, that hip-hop in the early 90s, which is the era I write about, it was a more important genre than, than rock or some of the older forms. That, that, that socially and, and, um, and even geographically, the way that gangster rap artists were singing about their neighborhoods with, with a specificity that almost recalled travel writing. That's what really attracted me to this project. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I wrote about the Ghetto Boys, which is a very um, lyrically offensive band. It's part of what makes them interesting is their music was so raw and so offensive, often as a way of being heard. Um, so, you know, maybe their Rick Rubin album, uh, The Ghetto Boys, or the next one, We Can't Be Stopped. But keep in mind that these are very, very raw gangster rap albums that are, that are very offensive. It's hard <laughs> to listen and not be offended. And so it, it was... It was actually it was years later that I realized the the intellectual import of the, of, of the rap phenomenon, um, but uh, you know to jump in a completely different um, flow. I, I have a friend, um, Rolf Kent. He writes music for movies. He did the he did the score for Sideways and About Schmidt and Legally Blonde and, and dozens of other movies. Uh, he's been creating this music uh, that is he calls ambitones or drone music, and it's sort of an ambient music. He 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 creates them to sort of help one focus during meditation. But I found them very useful in focusing during creative process. It's sort of I'm the type of guy who has sort of a monkey brain, and I can get a song stuck in my head or get certain thoughts that will distract me from the creative process. But his ambitone music, um, I have found. Um, it's created for meditation, but it helps me focus. It, it sort of cleans out the distractions from my monkey brain and allows me to focus to things on the screen. And um, his name is Rolf Kent, R-O-L-F-E-K-E-N-T, and um, his two Ambitone albums are called The Zen Effect. Uh, and again, it's, it's sort of background music. It's very much, it's, it's, it, it's cinematic in a sense, but it's not cinematic in a way that draws attention to itself. It's a way that can sort of occupy that monkey part of your brain so that you can get into the creative process. So I guess my rep- recommendations are from very different ends of, of the spectrum. Uh, is that this very in-your-face offensive gangster rap that is, that is not for everybody, but 
for me was very fascinating on one end. And then my other recommendation is music that's so ethereal that you, you don't have to pay attention to it. So those are my very idiosyncratic recommendations. That's great. And what we'll do is if, if our listeners go to jamestaylor.me and just put in Rolf Potts in the search bar, they'll be able to see all the show notes where we'll put all the, the links to these things as well. So let's imagine uh, if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So you have the tools of your trade, where that's, you know, pad and pen and a scrivener whatever that whatever you want to use and the the knowledge that you've acquired as a as a writer what would you do how would you kind of restart and i, I preface this by saying that uh, let's imagine no one knows your name no one knows who you are I, this really ties into what we were talking about a few minutes ago uh, about um sharpening the craft versus um self-promotion and and even though suddenly i don't have uh that that promotional capital that I've built up over the years um, and an and existing audience. I think the fact that I've honed my craft over the years and that I'm confident in it, even though I'm still a little startled by the blank page sometimes, the fact that I'm confident in my skills, um, I think that my approach wouldn't be that different. It's still about sitting down and getting the writing down done. It's about going out and reporting a travel story or having those experiences that, that can inform a good story. I think that once you have those tools, once your craft is at a certain level, you could restart, you could reboot. And, you know, it would take longer to sort of get through those first uh, barriers of, of uh, editors, or it would take me a while to, to get my name out through um, online or social media routes. But the fact that I already have the tools would make me very confident. And, and in fact, that's one thing about screenwriting is, I, you know, I have no cachet. I, I have a, a, a very established name as a travel writer and as a journalist, as a, as a teacher, I don't have a name as a, as a screenwriter. I don't even have an, a screenplay agent. But actually, I'm confident about that too. I think, I think that eventually, it might be 20 more years from now, that will come through because I'm, I'm getting deeper experience in that form. And I'm, you know, story craft and, and, and the craft of a writer is something that I'm so familiar with that I think my day to day life would be creatively would be exactly the same. There would just be more hoops to jump through in getting my work out there. But, but I think it would happen. And I think it's interesting. You, you talked about you know the switching gears, starting on the the screenwriting. I was reading something recently about someone that was just saying you know every ten years, you know, change, <laughs> make make quite a big change as well, um, because you, you end up going into this other thing. You carry with you the skills that you built up, but maybe if you're going into a, maybe it could be a related path, a related field, but um, you kind of go into it with a little bit more beginner's mind, I suppose. Um, and, uh, and you're not an expert. Um, and with it, that kind of brings a certain kind of energy to it as well. Yeah. Beginner's mind is, is very important. And then integrating your, your skills, you know, before I was a writer of any sort, screenwriting helped inform my, no, my, my nonfiction by giving it structure. Um, all these years later, I found that um, all my projects, but screenwriting especially, that reportage, the idea of going out and finding ideas, the, um, as a journalist or a travel writer, the idea that you don't know what your story will be yet, you go out and find these curious things of, that have happened in the world, um, that that is now informing my screenwriting. There are certain um, social or historical factors that are informing my screenplays in ways that had if had I just been sitting in a room inventing characters, um, wouldn't have come to me. And, and when you think about it, you get all, so many of, I just saw The Big Short, which is based on a Michael Lewis book, um, that the movie Argo, uh, about the yeah. Iran hostage crisis, that was based on a Joshua Behrman article. And so suddenly, if you had asked me, you know, the screenplays I was writing when I was 25 were, were really crappy Pulp Fiction ripoffs. <laughs> um, Whereas the, what I'm working on now is much more rooted in real world events and, and real things that happened. And, and that's a strength that I learned from all my years as a journalist and travel writer. So it's interesting, the energy that they, that they feed each other. And I completely agree with you that after a while, um, if I had just continued to write the same kind of travel stories in the same way that I was writing 10 or 15 years ago, it, it, would have been, it wouldn't have been creatively interesting or satisfying as going in with a beginner's mind and trying different things. I did, I did investigative journalism for Sports Illustrated about three years ago, and it was such a refreshing and fascinating project for me, and screenwriting the same way and writing about hip-hop the same way. Um, again, because you, I, I'm, I'm 
shunted back to being a beginner in a certain ways. I have to educate myself. I have to come, overcome obstacles that I wouldn't have to if I was just writing my 571st travel story <laughs> with its inherent epiphanies. So it's been good for me. Well, Rolf, thank you so much for coming on the show and, uh, and sharing your journey as a, as a writer and as a, as a creative. Uh, I wish you all the best in uh, the future project. I look forward to um, hopefully watching the, the movie when it comes out or whatever the, the, the project you're working on. Share the best ways that listeners can connect with you and learn more about uh, what you're up to. Uh, they can go to my website, which again has been there since 1998, rolfpotts.com. Uh, and you can find my, my email there, rolf, rolf, rolfpotts.com. And I'm, I'm happy to engage you via email, time allowing. Um, I, I also tweet every now and then at, at Rolf Potts on Twitter. Um, yeah, and that's it. My books are out there, Vagabonding. Uh, Marco Polo didn't go there. And this spring, my book on the Ghetto Boys will come out. Um, but yeah, I, I keep things up to date at rolfpots.com. Wonderful. And Vagabonding, a great, great book. If, if, uh, if our listeners haven't checked out that book, um, it's a fantastic... Uh, it will reset the way that you think about travel for, for a start. Um, Rolf, thank you so much for coming on the show and I wish you all the best in, in future. All right. Thanks a lot, James. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.